So today our speaker is Dr. David G. Riley. He's the professor of entomology at the University of Georgia, and he's going to be talking with us today about managing insecticide resistance in diamondback moth. So really looking forward to this, David. Thanks for coming today. Thank you, Kayla, and thanks, Joe, for, for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, can you hear me okay? You sound great. Okay. All right, yeah, first apologies for uh, missing uh, the February meeting. Uh, we had a broken pipe in the field and uh, just, when you get my age, you sometimes forget some appointments when you have an emergency going on, but uh, anyway. Um, today, I would like to uh, provide an update on some of our efforts over the last couple of years in Insecticide resistance management in the diamondback moth, uh, and um, this is uh, this has been a, a pest that has a major pest in cabbage and collards in, in Georgia since I arrived uh, back in '96, and um, so it's just been an ongoing problem. This is probably, I would have to say, it's one of the insect pests that uh, is most prone to insecticide resistance of the ones that I've dealt with over my career. So <clears throat> what I'd like to do today is provide just a, a brief introduction to the biology and uh, general insecticide resistance in the diamondback model. Um, and then I'd like to shift into the data that we have for the Southeast, specifically it's gonna be Georgia and Florida and how that data has affected our uh, recommendations for management. We'll be talking about maximum dose bioassays, uh, some LC50 work, and then uh, identification of genes that confer resistance in the population. Uh, and then finally, I will uh, talk a little bit about what we're doing to try to mitigate the problem uh, current extension efforts on uh, insecticide resistance management. And then um, uh, also looking at alternative, alternative controls, alternative to insecticide. So the diamondback moth um, is, uh, it's, a, it's, it's one of our most common pests in cabbage, collards, broccoli, cauliflower, and uh, the rest of the leafy greens, uh, the brassica leafy greens. Um, the, uh, the, egg, the, the moths, they lay their eggs either singly or in loose clusters. The, the picture on the left has got two eggs uh, next to each other on the leaf. They're difficult to see if you're not looking very closely. Uh, they hatch in about three to five days and develop to four larval instars, and that takes about 11 days under warm conditions. You can see the, uh, the first instars, uh, they look different from other left larvae that are in the field because you can get a window painting effect. They'll eat not all the way through the leaf. They'll leave, they'll leave a little um, uh, epidermal tissue on one side. So that's characteristic of diamondback moth. Uh, Fourth larva spins a cocoon, and this uh, cocoon can be, it's attached to either the leaf or, or the stem. Uh, this is actually a, um, a problem uh, as far as a contaminant in, in some of our crops, like broccoli. Uh, moths emerge from cocoons in about a week, and so the entire life cycle under warm conditions is approximately three weeks. And this is important. Uh, knowing the generation time is, is very important because most of our insecticide resistance management recommendations are based on generation time. And generation time changes with temperature. And so in this graphic, I have, uh, based on actual data from three years, 2010 to 2012, the, the time it takes to complete a, a generation of diamondback moth based on degree dates. And you'll notice looking at the shaded area, that's 2010, we, we basically had a single generation of uh, diamondback moth. This is from January to about the first of uh, 
of March, a single generation of Diamondback moth. And you see how that changed just in three years. We had some a warming trend. Actually, we've had a warming trend for, for a decade, but in this these three year periods, it was a stepwise warming trend. And you see what that does to the generation time of Diamondback moth. We went from basically a single generation to two generations by uh, 2012. And that's been an ongoing problem with uh, managing resistance in Diamondback Mall because with uh, greater numbers of generations in a year, we're having increased chance for selection for resistance. Uh, the, we typically uh, say that if you're growing a spring cold crop, uh, you typically have three generations of Diamondback Mall that you're dealing with. And so you, you are partitioning your rotations and sex cell rotations based on three generations. So where does the production of coal crops occur in the state of Georgia? Uh, the majority of that is in the southern part of the state, uh, more specifically the south central. And most of our coal crop production is transplanted. And so, um, uh, and in fact, 88% uh, of our transplant plant production occurs just in two counties. That's Tift and Colquitt counties, the ones I have circled in, in red. Um, that's important also from the standpoint of insecticide resistance management, because if you were to select for a resistant moth in the plant houses for the producing uh, transplants, and then you ship those out, you could be shipping out uh, resistant individuals across the state. So uh, paying attention to what's happening at, near the transplant industry is critical to managing insecticide resistance. The uh, number of acres in the state is around 20,000, and the value of the crop is about 100 million annually. Now, switching gears to talk about insecticide resistance. As I mentioned, uh, white fly, I mean, I'm sorry, I, I work with white flies too. Diamondback moth is one of the most uh, insecticide resistant prone insects in the world. And that's not just me saying that. If you look at the number of compounds that this particular insect has become resistant to, uh, it, it um, there's not very many in, uh, other insects that come close to it. And how does it do that? Well, it does that through a number of mechanisms. Uh, some are as simple as avoidance behavior, uh, not feeding on leaf tissue that, that's been treated with a pyrethroid. Uh, some of it's physical. You can have decreased penetration. So selection for, for larvae that have less penetration of the, uh, the insecticide toxin into the, the larva. Uh, a big one is metabolic detoxification or enzymatic cleavage, breaking down of those uh, toxic compounds once they get into the insect body and before it hits the target site. And then uh, probably the, the, the largest group or uh, probably one of the more significant groups for diamondback moth, uh, diamondback moth is target site modification. And a big one of those is target site modification within the uh, neuromuscular pathway, so in the nerve system. And so where do these insecticides, uh, where do they affect or cause mortality in, in a diamondback moth? Well, uh, uh, erythroids and doxycarb, they affect the uh, sodium potassium channels and the axon. Uh, you have a number of, of uh, insecticides that affect the uh, acetylcholinesterase synapse area. Uh, and then you, the uh, chloride channel uh, synapse area and the muscle you know, adjacent to the muscle tissue. So I, in this particular slide, this was provided by DuPont a couple of years back, and they, they claimed that uh, you know, greater than 90% of commercial insecticides all affect you know, these these uh, particular target sites. And so they're extremely important for insecticide resistance management. Now, uh, in the last decade or so, uh, we've had a new class of uh, insecticides, the diamides, and they're, they affect the uh, muscles themselves. So uh, the sodium channels in the muscle, uh, muscle tissue, uh, 
And so this was considered a, a, a brand new uh, mode of action, uh, something very different from the rest of the insecticides that we, that we deal with. And basically uh, the dynamites bind to the, uh, the ryanidine receptor causing calcium minus to be released. And so you get this uncontrolled muscle contraction. It's also very, this new class of uh, uh, insecticides was very specific, very specific for uh, insects. And so uh, almost no mammalian toxicity. So a really, really safe, considered really, really safe uh, set of chemistries. And um, unfortunately, because it was extremely effective when it was first released and because of um, heavy use in a couple other uh, factors I'll, I'll talk about later, we started to see insecticide resistance to this class of chemistries as well. And that, uh, that one little inset um, shows the specific um, mutation sites that occur in this um, um, channel that basically uh, doesn't allow those uh, toxins to divine like they normally do. So stepping back for just a second and looking at the, the history of diamondback moth resistance just in Georgia, on the, in the 80s and 90s, pyrethroid resistance was, was pretty widespread. Uh, but we had a number of compounds that were coming on board. And so uh, it was a serious problem, but then people switched to other compounds. But um, one of those was uh, spinosad or spinosad, the spinosad compound. And uh, when that was registered, uh, within a year, uh, because of the success of the compound and the, the desire to use this uh, uh, really effective uh, insecticide, we start to see resistance within a couple of years. That became uh, widespread and, um, and pretty much put an end to the use of uh, spinosa in, in, in Georgia. Um, we had another uh, spinosa type compound, the um, gradient that um, was still seen to be working, but there was great concerns of resistance to those. And then we started to see resistance to other compounds like the endoxicarb, noble uron, a, a, um, a growth regulator. And, um, and so we were already starting to see more of a problem with, with resistance and then you know, the uh, diamides were labeled. Well, as soon as the diamides got labeled, then everything, you know, went back to normal again, so-called normal, because they were working very well. And uh, so you, you tend to get, you see the pattern. People will switch to these new compounds and they overuse them. And within a couple of years, we have resistance. So the, um, the, First few years of uh, chlorinfranilipral, you know, uh, again, uh, it was extremely popular, extremely effective. Uh, one of the, the red flags that I, I alerted uh, DuPont to, you know, initially was, was worried about the, the um, active ingredient was so insoluble that it acted like a slow release. And so that, that's not good for insecticide resistance management. When the compound stays in the environment, and diamondback moths are, are exposed to it for multiple generations, that's a recipe for disaster. And, and in fact, uh, within a couple of years of extensive use of that, uh, resistance did occur. So this was some of the early LC50 data. Uh, it was very effective, you know, when it was uh, first labeled, you know, the uh, 2012 to 2013, it was working you know, quite well. But then, uh, then we started to see high levels. You know, by 2016, there was one incident of a, a 344-fold increase in resistance uh, to, to corrigin. Well, uh, it's a little bit more difficult to run LC50s than just to do a critical dose or a maximum dose. And what we opted for was a maximum dose just to try to get a picture of 
how much uh, resistance to, to foraging was out there and, and to other compounds. And what we used was a really simple bioassay. We, we, uh, we had a workshop or two with this where we, we trained uh, uh, growers and consultants how to do their own. Uh, we wound up doing a lot of them. But basically, it's a simple concept. You just take your highest level rate of your compound, you dilute it in the equivalent of 100 gallons to the acre, but you only mix up about uh, anywhere from 200 to 500 mils in a cup. You dip your leaves in, you put your, your larvae in, and then you do a reading on um, mortality 24 to, 40, or to 72 hours later. So when we did that, uh, we, we started to see in any, you know, a given population. So we'd go to a farm and we'd collect larvae and we'd look at a number of compounds to see what was working in that field and what wasn't. And in, the, in this particular two graphs, the, the black bars are the good bars. So if, if, they're, if it's killing them, that's good. The colored bars are not good. And you can see in the Colquitt, who is uh, a road uh, population, almost nothing was, was working in, in certainly foraging. And that's the highest label rate, again, uh, in a leaf tip. So, uh, and it was not there was no mortality at 72 hours. So effectively, the highest level rate, no effect. This went on, we were, by the time we started this, we, we started to get calls, uh, we, we got county agents involved. Uh, we had uh, county agents in, uh, in uh, Florida also asking to have bioassays done. Uh, some consultants would actually, they'd start sending us um, larvae to run the same kind of, do a, uh, an insecticide profile to see what was working in a given field. And remember, the reason for this is, you know, once you start getting a control failure and you're still trying to salvage your crop, you can't do, you, you, you have to find out what's working. You have to stop using what is not working because you're just creating uh, a longer uh, uh, persistence of that resistance problem in that population. And so trying to identify what works is, is critical. Um, these are a couple more sites. And uh, you can see that we typically would wind up with two or three compounds that we could actually use. And that's what that's how we would uh, salvage that particular field. If it got too bad, if nothing was working in the field or only one compound was working in the field, we basically, you know, encourage the grower to just get rid of the field, to uh, basically plow it in, because it was creating moths for subsequent plantings that were carrying those resistant genes. So looking at just a kind of a, uh, an average over uh, a number of sites, looking at you know, what was working, what was not working. Um, you can see in, in that dead larvae column, uh, anything with an A after that mean effectively said, yeah, these were working. But look at how, how many compounds are, are, are not working, not working well anyway. So everything from lanate all the way up. And so that was the situation, and this, this did include a couple of uh, Florida sites. Uh, we also, at that time, we were looking at the possibility of using NAC, a growth regulator. Uh, and that was because of, uh, if you look at the pupated column, you see that really low numbers of pupation uh, with NAC. Uh, it was not killing larvae, but it was stopping pupation. The problem with that particular compound was if you took away or if you stop applying NAC and it started to it, it started to lose its effect, those larvae would go ahead and pupate anyway and they would emerge anyway. So it was only a temporary slowdown of that population and not really something we would recommend. Now this, um, this is a picture of some of the counties in the Georgia, uh, Florida production sites that we sampled. And I put this up because um, this shows you that even amongst uh, a single uh, group of 
insecticides like the diamide. So I've got two here. I've got chlorantronilaprol, which is Corrigin, or cyantronilaprol, which is XRL. And um, the black colored uh, counties are not good. So uh, not that means you're not getting any much control at all. And you can see, just looking at those two maps, that there's a difference between chlorantronilaprol and cyantronilaprol. So we actually are seeing some differences even within the same you know, insecticide uh, IRAC group. And that's something that we're still trying to figure out. One of the ways to figure that out is to look at the genetics of resistance to see what's actually controlling uh, this resistance. You know, we, we got uh, Dr. Don Champagne involved and um, when the graduate student, we started to look at some of these populations and trying to figure out what was actually causing the resistance. Uh, the good, good news is, you know, for us at the time is there was uh, a number of studies that had already identified those genes in other parts of the world. So all we had to do was look for the same genes and, and try to figure out the frequencies of those genes. So um, in some of the first uh, work that was done, uh, we did find a, a single gene mutation. Um, and uh, this was in the ryanidine receptor site uh, in, the, in the muscle. And, um, and we found differences between a susceptible population and a resistant population. So the mutation was there. Uh, also, uh, by this time, uh, some of those LC50s that we you know, originally were like 300 volt were now up in the thousand volt. And that had to do with the fact that uh, a lot of these populations, the, the frequency of those resistant genes had actually increased. Once the frequency gets really high, then you can see these huge differences between a susceptible and resistant population because you know, uh, most of those individuals have that mutation. And this just gives you a, uh, uh, a picture of, of uh, five different uh, Diamondback moth populations and the, uh, the relative um, frequency of those um, resistant, resistant genes, the uh, G4946E uh, gene, which is the one that has been consistent in the populations that we've sampled in Georgia and Florida we have not identified other diamide resistance genes that have been identified in other parts of the world. So it looks like at least our system for the time being is, is relatively simple uh, that we have this uh, single gene mutation in the population. And so that's, that's where we are with that. The, uh, we are looking for other types of uh, resistance. Um, uh, you know, and Probably the ones that we're, we're most concerned with is that some of these uh, target site mutations, along with you know, metabolic detoxification, is where we're going to have those situations where we've got uh, not only resistance to one compound, but multiple compounds. And so we're really interested in trying to quantify you know, what's going on in that area. Bottom line is uh, diamondback moth uh, tolerance has, has been seen to the pyrethroids, uh, growth regulators. Um, Avant, Radiant, Plan A. And uh, so this is just going to be an ongoing problem. And one of the things that, uh, one of the ways we mitigate this problem is by using rotations. In other words, you use a compound that's working to treat that population and effectively kill as many individuals with that resistant gene as possible to reduce the carryover carryover of that resistance. The, uh, the extension efforts that we've done, we've done uh, uh, run bioassays from, like say, a two-state area. We have developed extension materials and some recommendations um, for rotations. And like I had said before, we typically see, like in the spring, you'd have three generations of diamondback moth. The fall, about the same. Summer, of course, you have more. But we have less uh, plants you know, grown in the summer. The cold crops just don't do well in hot temperatures. And, uh, and in the winter, yeah, you know, if you go back 
20 years ago, it was one generation. And so that was a very simple situation. Now it's a little more complicated. You can have two generations in the winter. So that's can be a little bit more tricky. Uh, we tend to steer clear of the older insecticides like the group 1A, 1B, and 3. Those are the organophosphates, carbamates, and pyrethroids. Uh, if you have to use them, try to use them at a single time and then don't go back because resistance to those is dominant and it stays in the population a long time. A lot of these other uh, compounds, the resistance are recessive traits, which is good for us. And it can be washed out. You can reduce the population and it has less of effect. Uh, but you'll see that we, we tried to have different uh, uses of different uh, groups like the, the group 28 or diamides. We like to recommend those to use in, uh, in transplant in the fall because you get double duty. You get uh, diamondback moth and white fly control. But to steer clear of that in the spring so you don't have that selection early in the spring. Um, Bottom line is, if you have a population that's not responding to a particular compound, you can't use it in the rotation. So you have to have multiple options. And so one of the things that the tank away, I guess, with this is, uh, you know, insecticide resistance management is important for all of our pests, but particularly for diamondback moth. That's kind of like the bellwether. It's, uh, if, it's gonna, if there's going to be insecticide resistance in a vegetable production system, Diamondback moth is going to be one of the ones that shows up first. And managing it is really important for long term sustainability of the ability to use the insecticide. Testing for the presence and frequency of known genetic factors is going to be a critical part of this management uh, uh, program. And so we're going to continue that. And of course, bioassays gives us short term solutions for good rotations. So where are we going? Well, you know, we can't just do the uh, resistance management. We're also looking at other possibilities. And, you know, one of the ones that, uh, of course, we use, uh, we do use um, uh, bio-rational type insecticides like BT. There's others like the nuclear polyhydrosis virus. Uh, there's a couple of companies that have been doing a lot of good work developing that for diamondback moth. And as we've been looking at some of that, uh, we're most recently, this last year, uh, we started looking at RNAi te technologies to target diamondback moth directly and uh, as a spray treatment. Uh, and then the, the probably the final solution, if you want to call it that, for really just getting rid of the problem uh, comes out of Cornell University. Tony Shelton has been trying to develop a genetic sterile release, and that would be to release these uh, individuals that the offspring do not, they don't have viable uh, female eggs. And um, there's been, but there's been political concerns about that because you're basically releasing a GMO uh, uh, moth into the environment and uh, people are, are uncomfortable with that. But that would be, eradication would be um, a, a possible, um, permanent solution to the diamondback moth problem. And with that, I think I want to stop. That's That was 30 minutes. I think I was only given 30 minutes to really talk. There's more than I probably should have talked, but uh, I do want to acknowledge the, the people that are working in this. It's not just me. It's uh, graduate students, undergraduates uh, across the street, ABAC, and uh, that help out the various funding agencies. And of course, my you know, colleagues, Don Champagne and Hugh Smith and the University of Florida is working with us. And I want to acknowledge him too. So with that, I think I'm going to stop the slideshow or should I just leave the slideshow on the screen in case there's questions about specific slides? Hmm, it might be a good idea to leave it up. I think that would be okay. So thank you, David, for that presentation. I think we got a lot of good information here, and um, I'm glad that you were able to do the study. I want to remind um, all the attendees of the webinar that if you have a question, you can put that into the Q&A box, and that's at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Or as I mentioned before, you can also raise your hand and we can actually unmute you and let you ask that question, um, just like you were coming up to a mic at a talk or something like that. So um, David, just as I was listening to 
you talk about the insecticide resistance, and I might have missed it at the beginning. Um, what crop specifically does diamondback moth actually affect? Yeah, so yeah, it's a good question. Uh, it, it's, it's limited to brassica uh, genus, brassica crops. So that would be cabbage, collards, uh, mustard greens, uh, um, you know, broccoli, cauliflower, it, it needs to be a brassica. They, they don't, uh, you know, they really don't get out of that crop grouping. And so, um, yeah, so that does limit it, you know, to a specific uh, group of crops. Um, we do have some um, uh, things like wild mustard, but in my experience, in the, the decades I've worked in Georgia, we really don't see a lot of diamondback moths on uh, the brassica weed uh, hosts. And part of that is because uh, we do have a healthy complex of parasitoids and, and uh, predators that, that work on this population. And so I think uh, really we're talking about a kind of a resident problem that's in our production system, a specific production system. So I know that your samples mostly came from Georgia and Florida, right? Is that where you were sampling? Right. So besides those states, how widespread are you seeing this resistance uh, for diamondback moth in the Southeast? It's, uh, it's wherever you have concentrated cold crop production, I would say that. If it's isolated, we see much less of a problem. So some of those areas, you know, outside of where we got most of our production, and I think it's similar. Uh, it's the same thing that we see in uh, Florida, and I've gotten calls from Alabama and, and some from South Carolina, where uh, you've got a you know a concentration of of coal crop production. I've also gotten uh, calls from New York, and the reason for that is uh, my colleague up there, Brian Nall, basically <laughs> complaining that uh, perhaps some of the transplants that are being produced in the South being shipped up the East Coast you know, are carrying some of those resistant genes with them. And he, he's, he's probably got a point, you know, but um, uh, there's no way to know specifically. You need to have to track it. And uh, that's a little hard to do. Are they seeing that just in New York or are they seeing that all up the East Coast? I would say any place uh, where you know, diamondback moths, uh, as far as reported resistance, it's one of the most widespread uh, reported resistance across the world. So in the U.S., it occurs you know, on the east, on the, the west coast, uh, anywhere, like I said, where if you, if you wanted to find where a diamondback moth problem is going to occur, it's where your production is concentrated. And uh, we in the South tend to have more of a problem because we have warmer temperatures, we have more generations, and so we have more chances for selection for resistance. In the winter, if you have a, a, a clean break in the production system and there's no, nothing out there for them to feed on, and they, it's too long for them to overwinter and the pupils fade or whatever it may be, then uh, you, you can get this nice break. And that's really critical for um, reducing the carryover of resistant individuals from one generation to the next. So with that being said, um, how would you manage the resistance in say plant houses for transplant production versus the field? If it's uh, so important to make sure, you know, where it's coming from, how would you manage that? Well, I mean, some of the companies are actually managing to a certain extent, like when Radiant uh, was first labeled, they specifically did not label Radiant used for plant house production because they did not want to have a you know, pre-selection in the plant house and have those individuals shipped out. And they actually got involved with getting the departments of agriculture to enforce that. You know, they would actually say, you know, check these plant houses to make sure there's no residual. It's not labeled for that. It shouldn't be used for that. So you can have you know you can have that type of, of regulation. Of course, you can have clean production where you try to screen your your plant houses. But um, uh, I, to be perfectly honest, you know that's a more expensive option, and, and that doesn't happen a lot of times here. Uh, a lot of the plant houses are not that tight, 
And so um, it's easy for moths to move in. Thank you for that. I appreciate you explaining that a little bit more. Um, we got a question now from Wayne Bueller. And Wayne says that they may have stepped away and missed this part of your presentation if you talked about it, but can you comment on cultural control, specifically the use of overhead irrigation to thwart reproduction? Is that a viable option in Georgia? Yes, it is. Uh, yeah, the diamondback moths are uh, crepuscular in nature. They, they tend to get active and just as the sun's going down and that's when they mate. And so, uh, if you if you have uh, overhead sprinkler irrigations in the evening, just as the sun's going down, is that time period about an hour to an hour before to an hour after that the uh, sun is setting, and you run the irrigation during that time period, you can actually disrupt me. That is a you know there's I think at least one study showed that that that's a possibility you can reduce it. Uh, probably the biggest cultural thing that I can see that, you know, it's, it's just simply trying to reduce the carryover from one production system to another, trying to have some isolation between uh, uh, some sites so that you're not, you know, selecting for, if you're, if you're doing sequential plantings of 50 acres, it would be much better not to have these in the same uh, farm block, you know, have, them, have some separation basically between that in your next 50 acres that you're, you're planting, uh, if that's possible, if you can move that production around. Okay, great. Um, and we've got another question from Roger who says, thank you for the great talk. You mentioned the final solution of GM technologies. What's the likelihood that this might be approved by regulators? Ah, uh, good question. Um, <laughs> Oh, poor Dr. Shelton up there. I mean, he's uh, he's he's done his best. It, it, it you know he's basically shown that it, it it can work. You know, up in New York, you know, where they got permission, uh, experimental use, got a lot of blowback for it. Uh, the problem uh, the problem with that particular technology is they're they're creating a genetically modified diamondback moth. Okay, and they have to create it and, it and then they release it. And that particular diamondback moth, when it mates, uh, all of the eggs you know, from that mating, uh, they'll lay a full complement of eggs, but all of the female eggs will, will be sterile. Basically, they won't hatch out. The males will continue, they are those, the male eggs will, will hatch out and they will carry, carry on that same uh, lethal gene and then it'll try to mate and eventually, you know, all those individuals will eventually die out, you know. And so that's the way they develop the technology. Well, they got a lot of uh, problems with, like if you release a GMO moth, and let's say a GMO moth flies onto a organically certified cabbage field, and not that anybody's gonna be specifically looking at it, but if you did, if you sample a moth in a, organically certified field than it was a GMO moth, that's no longer a organically certified field. And so you can imagine lawsuits and things like that. So it, it is complicated. And you can see that what's happened with the industry is they've kind of, okay, well, that's going to be too difficult. Well, let's see if we can use RNA technology a different way as just a spray on. So basically folding it right into our regular spray system and it's it's more like a uh, a biorational control. You know, you you spray it on it. It does something to the the larva, and hopefully you get control. So uh, it's complicated and it has to do with the uh, regulation. And regulation in itself is complicated enough as it is. Okay, so we have another question coming from Jacob, and Jacob is wondering, has anyone asked growers their obstacle to rotating products to preserve efficacy? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, my, I, I'm, I'm relating it probably secondhand, you know, because it's going to be county agents that are the front people that deal, you know, with uh, with growers. But my my guess or my my impression is that 
in a lot of cases, they don't, they just don't have the data. So they either, you know, they didn't get a bioassay run, so they don't know what's actually working. And when you don't know what's working, you're kind of uh, flailing around, you know, trying to find something. And, and typically you start, they start combining, which is really the worst thing you can do. Because uh, combining basically, you know, you're already not, let's say the corrigin stops working. Now I add radiant and I spray that. Well, by spraying corrigin again, which doesn't kill anything, it just keeps that population nice and clean and homogenous for corrigin resistance. And now I'm adding on radiant resistance. And if I do that a generation or two, I'll get resistance to both corrigin and radiant and have two different target sites, both of them are resistant and those are gone. You know, once that population is selected that way, that's why I say if you keep adding on more materials that are not working, you eventually crash the whole system to where no insecticides are working. So uh, getting data, I would say, is the biggest constraint, you know, trying to get good data on your population. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we are open for taking, you know, populations. We typically, we need at least 150 larvae to run a, just a maximum dose bioassay. But I'm happy to share that with anybody, uh, anywhere. You know, if, if, uh, if they want to send us larvae, we will run it for you and, and give you some data. Fairly quick turnaround. So with trying to, um rotate the insecticides to manage this resistance, what's a good way to do that so you're not just adding on those resistances that you mentioned? Yeah, so uh, if you go back, let's see, just go back to that little example. Um, you know, you do need to have a, a plan and you do need to start at least categorizing some of your active ingredients, your IRAC groups in specific time frames that are going to coincide with a particular generation of Diamondback plant. Now I know it's it's complicated to, to get the exact, you know, when a generation starts or ends, but I think a good rule of thumb is if it's spring or fall, uh, just count on three generations in a growing season. And so kind of uh, separating out your uh, your groups of insecticides so that you can switch to a different IRAC group. You know, after your first three weeks or first generation, switch to a different IRAC group. And you may need, you know, oftentimes you need maybe more than one because you may try one and it doesn't work. If you do that, you really need to stay away from that mode of action, you know, uh, probably for the rest of the uh, season. If you can do that, if you do the rotations, the, the, good, the good news is, like where we've seen resistance to radiant, uh, and we've uh, backed off from use in a, a given farm. We've come back a year later and radiant worked great. So if you just back, because a lot of those resistances are, are uh, uh, recessive. And, uh, and if you back off on the selection pressure, they just kind of wash out uh, pretty fast. So that's the good news. If you can rotate and preserve things and not use everything all the time, uh, you're going to uh, preserve those insecticides for a lot longer period of time. And also, you know, the, doing the biorational, so the BTs, uh, the, the uh, nuclear polydrosis virus, that new product that I'm looking at, those are biologicals and, um, and they're compatible with uh, insecticides. So that, you know, the, uh, unfortunately, you know, our the beneficials, the uh, Cotesia and Didegma wasp that you can buy and use, but you need a lot of them. And uh, the what they sell, the the what they sell for um, releases, they they tend to sell you what you're willing to pay, which may not be enough. And so uh, to get really good control with a, a wasp, a parasitic wasp, you'd have to release a lot of it. And so your expense is going to be high, you know, if you go with parasitic wasp. Um, so there are some alternatives, but it all comes down to cost and what you can, that's what we're trying to figure out is a, the best, most cost effective way. Reduce our pesticide use, get the most uh, effectiveness out of what we do use and preserve long-term, you know, efficacy.
Thanks, David. That was a great in-depth answer. We really appreciate that. Uh, so not seeing any other questions, uh, David, do you have anything that you'd like to add before we wrap it up for today? No, just appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I've actually got to go to a pepper weevil talk pretty quick. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, this works out great. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, David. Again, uh, David G. Riley, Professor of Entomology at the University of Georgia. And uh, you can catch us on the next episode of the Southern IPM Hour on Wednesday, April 7th at 1 p.m. Eastern. And you can find out all of the information at southernipm.org. Thanks so much for coming. Have a great day. Thanks.